Soccer is great fun. For kids, no other sport is quite as captivating. They never seem to get tired of chasing the ball. Anyone can play soccer. The game's fascination has been apparent right from the start. Still, some things have changed since the old days. Sandlot soccer is on the decline. Today, most kids have their first contact with the sport in an organized league. But the fascination is still there, and that's why play is the most important part of practice for young players. A good league gives them the chance to play the game freely without restrictions. Most young players are proud to wear the names and numbers of their favorite players. They admire them and strive to be like them. Surely, the experience of actually playing on a team with these idols must be all the more unforgettable. The Adidas Cup Final has made it possible to do just that. The professional players have enormous influence as role models for developing players. Their approach to the game sets the standard for all training. Ultimately, the professional players of tomorrow can only reach that level through systematic training in their youth. The foundations for the future of soccer are being laid today. It's a long way from beginner to soccer star. It's a way that must be traveled in stages, and the goals, contents, and methods of each stage must be appropriate to each level of age and ability. The structure of the GSA children's program entails three levels of training. Basic training includes six through 10 year olds, levels F and E. Intermediate training, the second level, includes ages 10 through 12, level D, and 12 through 14, level C. Advanced training, the top level, includes 14 through 18 year olds. Der deutsche Fußball genießt in der gesamten Sportwelt ein hohes Ansehen. Das liegt daran, dass die deutsche Fußballnationalmannschaft sehr erfolgreich Fußball spielt. Deutschland ist seit 1954 dreimal Weltmeister geworden. Sie sind mehrmals Europameister geworden. Das liegt daran, dass in der Bundesliga ein sehr attraktiver Fußball gespielt wird, zu dem sehr viele Zuschauer kommen. Und das liegt nicht zuletzt daran, dass in unseren Vereinen und Verbänden eine sehr gute, fundierte Jugendarbeit geleistet wird. Der Deutsche Fußballbund hat ein sehr umfassendes Sichtungssystem für Fußballtalente. Diese Fußballtalente werden im Leistungstraining gefördert und herausgebildet, sodass sie in späteren Jahren in der Lage sind, im Seniorenbereich attraktiven und erfolgreichen Fußball zu spielen. Viele unserer Kinder und Jugendlichen sehen in den Nationalspielern ihre Vorbilder. Sie kommen in die Fußballvereine, um das Fußballspielen zu erlernen und um diesen Vorbildern nachzueifern. Wir Trainer müssen unseren Kindern und Jugendlichen ein interessantes, ein altersgerechtes Training anbieten, an dem die Kinder und Jugendlichen Spaß und Freude haben, damit sie das Fußballspielen auch spielend erlernen. Und um das zu erreichen, müssen wir das Spielen, und da bietet sich insbesondere das Spiel 4 gegen 4 an, in den Mittelpunkt unseres Trainings stellen. Aus diesem Spiel 4 gegen 4 heraus ergeben sich alle weiteren Trainingsziele zum Erlernen der Fußballtechnik und einfacher taktischer Handlungsweisen. Dieses Video gibt uns Trainern eine Menge an Anregungen für ein interessantes, abwechslungsreiches und kindgemäßes und jugendgemäßes Training. Es bietet neben Spielformen eine Reihe von Trainingsformen an, die den Kindern und Jugendlichen Spaß und Freude bereiten und die ihrer persönlichen Entwicklung dienen.
Next, we'll introduce the most important guidelines for instruction of the youngest players. The first principle is learn soccer by playing. Most kids who have been introduced to soccer like it and want to play. That's why they join leagues. A soccer league gives them their first real taste of the game, which makes it all the more important that fun and excitement be part of that experience. Small soccer games with lots of variety and opportunities for scoring are the heart of children's training. The games shown here are just a small sample. The possibilities are endless. We will explain more of them as we go along. The first principle means precisely that Sandlot soccer must find a new home in the soccer league. If coaches focus on that idea, they're guaranteed to be on the right track. The second principle is the ball should always be the focus of training. It seems so obvious that we almost shouldn't have to mention it. For a soccer player, the ball is a tool. The more contact young players have with this tool, the more opportunities they have to explore its possibilities, the handier they become with it. In practice, a ball should be provided for every player. Fundamental points and exercises should always be practiced with a ball. Without a ball, there's no motivation and no fun. The third principle is, everyone can join in. Kids tend to have short attention spans. For them, there's nothing so aggravating as doing nothing. They have a great desire to move, and coaches should always structure practices around this desire. When you're choosing exercises and games, always consider, can everyone play, including weaker players? If not, some of the kids will quickly find themselves watching from the sidelines. A good organizational rule is, the smaller the groups and the playing fields, the more likely it is that everyone will get a chance to play. In games with goals, teams should be no bigger than four a side. Another hint for maximum participation is that you can play on multiple playing fields at once. Another alternative that's interesting and easy to organize is station training. Here we see one possible configuration. We'll show you many more possibilities in video two. The fourth principle, practice should be fun. Even the simplest games and exercises, if presented in an interesting way, are lots of fun and encourage maximum participation. Here, for example, we have crab soccer. Or how about controlling the ball like a goalie? It's fun for all and teaches dribbling skills at the same time.
The most important tools for motivation at this age, though, are small competitions. Kids always like to compete and be better than one another. The best way to hold their interest is with competitions to see who can score the most goals. But don't forget, set up small practice groups and lots of goals. Lots of goal shots for everyone must be guaranteed. The impression the coach makes on his players is also very important at this age. His movements, gestures, demonstrations, and words should all communicate his own enthusiasm for the most wonderful game in the world. Therefore, the last principle is, a coach must be able to motivate and inspire his players. In this regard, one point must be clearly understood. Children at this age learn by watching. This means that the best learning starts with a proper demonstration of soccer techniques. What should you keep in mind while demonstrating? You'll find lots of tips and encouragement as you watch this video, but the most important thing to remember is don't interrupt or take over too often. Always let the kids try things out for themselves first. Then you can give them help where they need it. Now we'll introduce some practice formats for six to 10 year old boys and girls. They're divided into four major building blocks. The first building block is motion and coordination training with the ball. The solo exercises shown here all contribute to skillful and creative ball handling. Coordinated ball handling is an indispensable foundation for greater accomplishments in soccer. The players start out freely dribbling amongst each other in a practice area. They should try out everything they've learned with the ball so far. For example, different ways of changing direction. Such exercises in coordination training can constitute the warm-up period of a children's practice session. The task becomes more difficult when the practice area is made smaller which players are still able to control their own balls without bumping into each other. Who can change directions in close quarters?
Now the players change direction only when the coach gives a hand signal. This means they have to have enough confidence in their dribbling to take their eyes off the ball and look around. Here, we lay the first foundations for a greater awareness of the game. The next exercises combine dribbling with some other basic skills, such as stopping the ball with the knee. Many young players start out with poor coordination, moving stiffly, losing their balance, and so on. Therefore, soccer practice should give the youngest players an opportunity to develop their physical potential in the most interesting ways possible. The next exercise requires players to stop the ball with the knee as before, but also change direction at the same time. Who can do this best? And now something still more difficult, the players stop the ball with the knee, then pull it with the sole and inside of one foot behind the standing leg and away to the side. These more difficult exercises are exactly the ones that benefit most from a demonstration by the coach. Afterwards, give the players time again to try out the exercise. Here, the players stop the ball from behind. This requires them to match the movements of their bodies exactly to the movements of the ball. It's not so easy to keep your balance. You can see how many ways this exercise builds coordination. In this exercise, the players have to pull the ball back. Who can cover the distance in the shortest time? This exercise is one of the harder ones, so it's all right if the kids don't pick it up all at once. Now, the kids let the ball dance between the feet. The goal is to touch the ball as quickly and often as possible. The more advanced players can be assigned extra tasks. For example, move the dancing ball forward or backward. As they learn different foot tricks, kids gain the ability to make quick and surprising changes of direction. Here, the coach demonstrates. Dribbling straight ahead, he pulls the ball quickly back with the sole of his foot and then moves it sideways with the outside of the same foot. Once again, the kids get a chance to experiment with what they've seen.
This time, the player pulls the ball behind a standing leg with the sole of the other foot and then moves it sideways with the inside of that foot. And once again, These ball exercises form the basis of creative, accomplished, and attractive soccer. One further possibility for changing direction. With the sole, the player pulls the ball quickly out of dribbling and then pushes it sideways with the inside of the same foot. Here's another perfect execution. Along with coordination training exercises, running games can also be a part of the warm-up phase of a practice session. The first variation is called capture. In this simple game, two catchers carry shirts in their hands for easy recognition. Whoever gets caught immediately trades places and becomes the new catcher, who's been caught the least during the time period. As you can see, this game teaches soccer players the most important elements of movement, sudden changes of direction, fainting, tackling, stopping abruptly in a way that's fun for everyone. In this old favorite, the players pair up holding hands. One pair is designated catchers for a certain period of time. Which pair can make the most captures? Now, the next pair of catchers get started. Naturally, you can also organize many interesting games of tag that involve the ball as well. Here, all players dribble among each other in a designated area. Two catchers carrying shirts try to catch one of the dribblers. Whoever gets caught takes the shirt from the catcher, who was catcher the fewest number of times. Here's a game that's lots of fun but can only be played on an outdoor field, the players are divided into pairs, and one player, as a goalie, tries to win the ball from the other players. As soon as the goalie is successful, the players switch roles. Now here is the same game, but with permanent goalies. 
two designated players have a certain amount of time, about a minute, to take control of as many balls as possible. Which pair succeeds most often? You can see that fun and participation are both guaranteed. Juggling exercises are yet another way to increase ball coordination. Again, there are innumerable possibilities. Here, the players have to kick the ball overhead with the instep and immediately catch it with the other hand. For motivational purposes, it's desirable to combine juggling exercises with little competitions as often as possible. For example, who can accomplish the move the most often in the space of a minute? Here, the coach goes over the results of a juggling competition. Rating performance is very important to kids and should never be forgotten. Here, the players have to juggle the ball once with the right thigh and once with the left in rapid succession before catching it again. Players won't necessarily get it right on the first try, so the coach's job is to keep their spirits up and motivate them to intensive practice. The next exercise is still more difficult. The kids kick the ball overhead with the instep, let it bounce once on the ground, and kick it immediately up in the air again. Only a very few young players can juggle the ball so well at this age, but with regular practice, you'll soon notice improvements. Interesting exercises can also be developed by adding gymnastics to juggling. This time, instead of the coach, a player demonstrates the exercise. Kick with the instep, squat, and back up again in time to catch the ball. These juggling exercises work as competitions, too. The ball can be played with any part of the body. The demands of a particular juggling combination stimulate coordination and improve the ability to handle the ball. The combination we see here follows the sequence instep, thigh, catch. The exercise can easily be expanded by adding another element to the sequence, for example, instep, thigh, head catch.
the second building block of youth soccer is playful instruction in the techniques of the game. This category includes some interesting exercises that teach individual soccer techniques in a way that's fun and appropriate for kids. Now, on to the first exercise. In pairs, players take turns trying to shoot between the cones using the inside of the foot. The competitive aspect is as important here as before. Which of the two is the first to score five goals? Of course, we're not trying for perfect technical execution at this point. Kids should learn the basic techniques. Here, for example, passing in its basic form to begin with. Eventually, they'll develop their own personal style of handling the ball. It's even more fun to have competition shooting at real goals. Here, both players act as goalie and shooter. Each side gets to take two shots on a turn without advancing past a certain line. Which pair can score five goals first? Here, we see everyone playing goalie. In practice, make sure every player takes a turn playing goalie, since it often takes some time for genuine goalie skills to develop. Don't lock players too early into the goalkeeper position. Since it's unlikely you'll have enough real goals for shooting competitions with small groups, it's usually enough to set up some makeshift goals. A tip that can help with organization, one player plays goalie while the other waits behind the goal to retrieve the ball. After a few shots, they switch roles. This also helps to avoid long interruptions while someone chases after the ball. Gradually, players should learn to dribble the ball with more and more control. In other words, closer to the foot. Slalom dribbling exercises help to improve their control. A few suggestions. One, for motivation, slalom exercises should be combined with a goal shot. Two, divide the players into groups playing on several different slalom courses. There should be no more than six players on any course Otherwise, they'll have to wait too long between turns. Three, always set up a competition. For example, which group can be the first to score five goals? Slalom exercises make relatively high demands on the player's coordination with the ball since they have to change direction so often.
here the players pass the ball toward the goal, run through the slalom course as fast as possible, then shoot on the goal. This exercise improves ball technique as well as running coordination. Dribbling competitions between two players are another fun possibility for slalom practice. The first variation, on a sign from the coach, the first player in each group starts out on the course. The first one to reach the end may shoot at the goal immediately. The other has to dribble around the last cone until he gets his turn to shoot. Which player can score the first goal? Here's another possibility for dribbling competition. Now the player who lost the slalom race goes 1v1 against the goalkeeper. The slalom winner gets to take another shot on goal. Here it is again from a different perspective. Different ways of controlling the ball are basic techniques children at this age should learn. In this exercise, the ball is passed to the shooter from the side. He moves the ball quickly toward the goal and then shoots. He rejoins the passers and the next player gets a chance to shoot. With larger groups, two goals should be set up so no one has to wait too long. Again, all the technical details don't have to be perfect. Remember, the youngest players need to try out the movements first. There will be plenty of time for fine tuning later. This player demonstrates it almost perfectly. Notice how he glances away from the ball for a last look in the direction of the goal right before he shoots. All the players are active and everyone gets lots of shots at the goal. As we've said before, it's not good to assign one player permanently to the goalkeeper position too soon. However, if a player has fun guarding the goal, you can begin preparing him for the role in practice and in games. But don't forget that he'll be called on to play as a field player occasionally too. Here, the shooter positions himself with his back to the goal and receives a pass from the backfield. He turns the ball toward the goal with the inside of the foot and shoots.
These players can do it almost perfectly, but don't worry if it doesn't always go this smoothly. Now the shooter turns the ball toward the goal with the outside of the foot. This type of ball control is a bit more difficult, so be patient if it doesn't work right away and encourage the players to keep trying. Again, the practice groups should be as small as possible. Here, the players are practicing on two goals at once. The third building block of youth soccer is playing in small groups. For kids, small, unforced soccer games are the most important part of soccer training. Remember, children want to play and play and play. We begin with the smallest setup possible, 1v1. Here, players have to use all the skills they've learned, both attacking and defending. Defenders can be tricked if they're not careful. Because it can be so demanding, children shouldn't be allowed to play 1v1 for too long. In the group we see here, for example, a different pair takes the field after every shot on goal. The next larger combination is 2v2, shown here with two real goals with goalkeepers. This encourages combination play with another player to set up a shot on goal. The situation changes constantly, requiring quick decisions. As you can see, the players make plenty of goal attempts and experience lots of success. Practice doesn't have to be boring.
When you have a lot of playing groups, it makes sense to set up goals so you'll have enough for everyone. Be sure to have plenty of extra balls ready by the goals to avoid interruptions. Another alternative is 2v2 with goals made of poles set about two yards wide. Here, it takes even more skill to get a shot on goal. In these intense conditions, the players experiment with the possibilities and soon learn to play as a team. Now a third player is added to each team. This makes the game still more complex and enhances the possibilities of combination play. From these scenes, it's obvious that small, goal-oriented soccer games are exciting, enjoyable, and effective training for children. Through the simple exercise of playing with two goals, kids absorb the basics of soccer's most important techniques and tactics. Scoring a goal, what could be more exhilarating for any soccer player? In this game, two of the defenders stand in the goal as goalies, resulting in a 3v1 situation. With 3v1, the attackers can pass and shoot more easily. As soon as they either score goal or lose the ball to their opponent, two of them become goalies and the defenders get a chance to attack. Here, we have two groups of 3v3 playing on a 30 by 40 yard field. The attackers get one point for dribbling past their opponents and across the defender's end line. This is a good example of winning on points. Which team has scored the most points after five minutes? D2 
VCing show how small games can teach the basics of versatile dribbling, confident teamwork, and skillful defending. Last but not least, the fourth building block of youth soccer, the transition from practice games of 4v4 to matches of 7v7. <laughs> 4v4 is the ideal size for kids between 6 and 10 because it's the smallest configuration possible in which all the technical and tactical elements of the larger game are evident. 4v4 lends itself to the teaching of all the components of an attractive playing style like goal-oriented combinations, creative solo moves, and original attack strategies. Because of these benefits, we recommend devoting one out of two practice sessions per week entirely to games of 4v4 played freely and scored. You can set up as many as two 4v4 fields in one half of a regular playing field. This also makes practice tournaments possible. v4 is the ideal size for practice games as you can see but what about official matches obviously it makes sense to run matches in a way that's appropriate for kids too matches can fulfill an important role in training at all ages but only as long as they're appropriate to the abilities and interest of the kids playing ultimately for six to ten year olds it just doesn't make sense to hold matches of 11 v 11 on the entire field with full-size goals. Seven v seven has many advantages over eleven v eleven. One, the players get more touches on the ball. Two, they get more chances to shoot goals. Number three, technique counts more than stamina. Four, every player must attack and defend, so they're constantly involved in the game. The full-size field really has no role to play at this age level. Even a half-size field is too big for 6- to 10-year-olds playing 7v7. The perimeter of the field is marked off with cones. The penalty, side, and center lines can also be used as boundaries. Then the small goals are set up. The field for this match of 7v7 between the penalty line and the sidelines is about 36 yards across and 55 yards long. The basic setup the players arrange themselves in front of the goalie in two rows of three each, one row of defenders and one row of attackers. In time, the players will become familiar with these positions.
Success in Soccer, the teaching magazine for winning soccer, new in the U.S. In Success in Soccer, soccer experts show how to teach techniques and tactics in the right way. Success in Soccer shows what you can learn from professional coaches. Success in Soccer shows how to improve your team's game. Success in Soccer gives practical tips on specific subjects. Success in Soccer has lots of helpful diagrams and photos. Success in Soccer comes out in six issues per year, each issue containing 40 pages full of interesting information for coaches who want success in soccer. Success in Soccer is available from Manny Clar, Post Office Box 92046, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87199. Phone number 888-828-GAME. That's 4263.